everyone, this is Yoni for CG Forge. Welcome to another Node Bible entry. Today we're talking about the Ray Node. The Ray Node is mainly used to transfer one geometry on top of another geometry, or transfer attributes between them, or establish groups. So, for it to make more sense, let's jump into Houdini and go through the different examples. I prepared a basic scene in Houdini. I loaded it in a model of this table kind of thing. And basically, in order to show you what the Ray Node does, I have a grid that I transformed up to above the table. And then I appended a ray node. Basically, in the first slot, you want the geometry that's getting projected or deformed into the other geometry. We can call it the ray geo, just to keep things simple. This is not the official name. And we have a collision geo. So that's a geo that's colliding with our ray mesh. So let's append it and see what's happening. So as you can see, we have this grid that was here. And it's now being projected on top of this table. That's the primary use you can have with the Ray node to project one type of geometry on another type of geometry. But it's not exclusively. We'll go into some other examples later, how you can transfer attributes between two meshes and groups, etc. But first, let's go to the different options. As always, you can use groups in Houdini. So say if you only want to transfer a certain group. So we're going for primitives. So Let's select some primitive in this mesh. I'll add this. And if we select just a square like this, and we group this, and this is group one. And maybe let's create a group as well for the collision geo, so we can see straight away what happens. And then I'm going to select this based on the normal direction with a spread angle 30, just so I can get this upward facing bit without this clock there. And now let's go into the Ray node. And first of all, if we select group one, you can see of the Ray geometry, so the geometry that's getting projected, only those polygons get transformed. So this is something that might be useful to you. I think more often, what's even more useful is using the collision group. So as you can see now, instead of intersecting with this clock, so if you see here, we have this table. So instead of you know, this pointer, this clock pointer that we have here, instead of intersecting with that, because we've grouped it in this bit, it doesn't intersect with that and it goes straight onto like the top surface geometry. So that's actually very handy if you want to project your ray geo on top of a specific part of your collision geo. So let's disable this for now. So one of the main options that really drives what happens in this transformation is the method. We either use project rays which projects the rays along a vector. So a good way to show this actually is when you have this ray geo and you have the collision geo here, basically what it does is currently it looks at the normals and then goes straight down, straight down, straight down until it hits part of the collision geometry. And it kind of stops the points or primitives depending which entity you're choosing on, which is what you set here. It will stop it at the point that it collides with the geometry and then these other points will continue until they hit part of the geometry. And that's what you can see is happening here. Another option what you can do is minimum distance. With minimum distance, it just finds for each point or primitive, again, depending which option you go for, it looks for the closest point next to that point on the collision geometry. So as you can see here, we're getting a very different deformation because they're not projected alongside a vector. So this could be handy in some instances, we'll go to it later. But for now, let's set this back to project rays, because the project rays gives you a few options to go from. So by default, it goes from the normal direction. So it would just see wherever the normals are pointing towards, it will just follow that direction until it hits the surface. You can set this to any vector as well. And by default, this is still set in a normal direction. So you need to get rid of that expression. And then you can say which direction it should go into. So if you set it to minus one in this example, it will go down on the y-axis until it hits the geometry. But you can set a different angle as well. So for example, if you can see, if we move along the x-axis, it gets a bit of an angle. So you can do that on the z-axis as well. So that's something you can tweak. And you can also set it to a custom attribute. So if you create an attribute beforehand, then you can use that attribute to drive the direction of the ray projection. Then we can disable the show guide 
geometry. So also if we get rid of the template, we can see that we lose the collision geometry visualization. So that's sometimes quite handy because sometimes it gets a bit too much. Then we have transform points. Transform points decides whether the transformation is getting applied or not. So by disabling that, it seems like it does nothing, but this you can use to transfer attributes between them. For example, you have point intersection distance. And if we go to the geometry spreadsheet, basically here you can see there's a distance attribute that's being mapped on the ray geometry. And if we move this up, then you'll see those distance attributes increase. And the distance attributes you can then use in different types of setups. So you can use it to drive simulations or displacement effects or anything like that. So let's disable this now and let's enable the transform points again. So we get our transformation. And what we can do as well is we can intersect the farther surface. So basically by default, if I template the mesh again and disable this, as you can see, the mesh will kind of just go down. So as I showed you before, we have this grid that goes down and down and down until it hits the surface and then it collides with it. But we can also say, don't hit the first bit, hit the last bit you can hit. So this could be interesting for if you need to collide with spheres or, or things like that, and you want it to be on the outside of the object instead of the inside. So that's something you can use for that. And let me disable the template again. Then there's the point intersection normal. This is a bit of a tricky one. But what it does is it transfers the normals from your collision geometry onto your ray geometry. As you can see on the collision geometry, all these normals are kind of pointing up and a bit to the side here. And basically, if we enable this on the ray geometry, then you can see our normals are pointing in the direction that the collision geometry is pointing at. However, it doesn't change the winding order of the primitive. So basically, if you append the normal node again after this, then your normals are just pointed downwards again. So it's a bit of a tricky node. In general, if you want good normals on your ray geometry, what you should do is just reverse the normals first. And then if you append the normal node, then you get the normals in the right direction. And as you can see, our geometry is displaying a lot better now. So in general, it's not something I would use, but it's there in case you need it. And then there's reverse race. So as I said before, I keep coming back to it because it's such an important concept to understand. But basically, as I said, this will just go down and down and down until it hits it. But obviously it goes along the normal direction or the vector direction that you give it beforehand. But if you want to reverse that, so say if we move the grid below our collision object and we want to let it collide that way, we can reverse the race. So when we reverse the race, this will now go in the opposite direction of the normal or the project ray direction that we give it, like a custom vector. And now you can see we have this intersection at the bottom of the geometry. So that is something that might be quite handy instead of moving your object around. And that way, sometimes your normals are in a saner place as well, like with this one, because the normals of the grid are pointing already like in the right direction here. So that might make it a bit easier to do your ray transformation. Then we get to ray tolerance. Let me reset this again to the top and move it up. And as you can see, now it hits the top of the surface again. Basically ray tolerance. This is useful sometimes when your meshes are not water tight and therefore the ray effect might sometimes miss certain points. So if you get weird deformations, this is a value to play with. In general, I don't use it a lot, but again, if you use a mess that's not watertight and you get weird artifacts, then this is something you want to tweak. Then let's move on to scale. Scale basically is the strength of the effect. So when I move it up, you can see the extrusion is getting larger and larger or like more extreme. So the difference between the highest and lowest point is larger, which is very different from the lift. So when you lift it, the extrusion effect is exactly the same, but kind of the plane where it hits just gets displaced further along the axis of where it hits from. So again, in our case, it's the normals, but you can set a custom vector direction, but it will basically keep going that direction with the same displacement effect. So that's something quite useful if you want to have a certain strength of your ray cast, but you want to move it a bit further along the axis, then that's something you can play with. Then we have the bias. The bias basically decides 
what is the minimum distance the collision geometry needs to be away from the ray geometry in order for it to hit. So if it's at zero, then it would just hit anything that's nearby because again, the minimum distance is zero. But as we move this up, you can see some parts are not hitting because that part is bigger than the 0 0.2 and this is in meters. So the collision geometry has to be at least 20 centimeters away before this effect works. So in that way you can play with where you want this geometry to hit your collision geometry. And you can see as we scale it up, it will just hit the bottom parts of this mesh. What we also have is a max distance. So how far can the ray geometry be away as a maximum before the effects stop working? Again, now it's at zero, so obviously nothing will work. But as we scale it up, you can see it hits certain parts of the geometry and you can play with the bias and max distance for it to set a minimum and maximum distance if you want the effect to happen on a specific place of your collision geometry. Now let's go to sample. This one I found it a bit tricky to figure out, but I made a visualization for it that makes it quite easy to understand. So basically what I've done here is I just have a grid. I transformed it up. I gave it normals. So we have a normal pointing in the normal direction. And then I just created a point out of it. And then I copied the points. So we have a lot of the same points in this area. And this is basically what the sample does. When we move the samples up, we give every point or primitive, again, depending which entity you choose, we give it these extra points. So when we do 100, we generate 100 points on those points. And out of the box, it doesn't change anything because these samples are all pointing in the exact same direction. But when we move up the jitter scale, you can see we get smoother meshes. And again, let's go back to the simple example. And what I've done here is I visualized a point. So basically, if we have no jitter scale, this is what happens. We have the vector, the normal in this case, pointing straight down or like in our case with an angle. And what we then do is we create a jitter, so a random effect. So every point will get a little bit of randomization, again, dependent on your jitter scale. So for each point, it will hit a slightly random part of the surface. Because these points are getting projected in slightly random places, it smooths everything out a bit. And the way it gets smoothed out is by this ray combiner effect. So if I disable the normals again, and we have a jitter scale of 0.1 now, which the documentation doesn't really say what these units refer to. I suspect they're meters, so 10 centimeters of jitter scale maximum because with angles, it goes pretty crazy, pretty quickly. So that's my assumption, but I can't find it officially online. But usually I need quite small values for this. So we have four functions we can use. Average ray is an average function, uh, just like any math average function. A median function is like a math median function. So basically the difference between average and median for non-mathicians is that the average the more extreme values have more of an importance in the calculation. So basically, if you have values of one, two, three, and 100, that 100 basically bumps up the values quite a bit, where with a median function, if you have one, two, three, and 100, that 100 has less impact. It's the easiest way to explain. <laughs> but anyway, with an average function, it smooths everything out quite nicely. With shortest ray, it will just use whichever ray is shortest, so the shortest distance from the ray geometry to the collision geometry, and with the longest ray, whichever ray is longest. And again, this is between the ray geometry and the collision geometry. So for smooth meshes, I would say use an average ray because that makes everything just nice and smooth. And then you can play with the jitter scale. If you go a bit too high, you get slightly weirder artifacts. So this is a balancing game, I would say. And then you can change the seed of this as well, because jitter functions are based on random values. Random values have seed numbers. So this is the seed number for that. And then we get to our point group. So basically what we can do is if I disable the samples to make it extra quick and I scale up the grid a bit. So I basically want to create it bigger than the table is. So some parts of the grid will hit the table and some parts won't. Then what you can see, if we create a point group and I visualize the point group here, we get a ray hit group 
So basically everything that's hit, so every ray geo that collides with a collision geo will be put in that group. And everything that doesn't hit won't be put in that group. And this is why I come back to the transform points. Because again, it's not like the transform point doesn't do anything. It's more like if you just want these groups to transfer. So for example, you have a grid and you want to transfer some shape or some piece of geometry on there, then you can do this with the create point group. So that's quite a handy function. And what you can also do is you can import attributes from hits. So for example, this mesh has UVs. And if we now ray this down and let me hide this group visualization, you can see we get the UVs from a collision geometry onto a ray geometry. So that's a very handy feature. And we can also do this with CD. So if we append a color node, for example, and maybe delete the shop material path, because sometimes that interferes a bit. And we give it a, maybe like a red color, just so it's quite obvious. And what we can see now is we get a red color imported. We can also transfer this to yellow maybe. And now you can see we get a yellow color and you can go to the geometry spreadsheet as well to see what the color is that you transferred because sometimes with the UVs or maybe your Houdini viewport doesn't display correctly. So it's always good to refer to the geometry spreadsheet for this. And now lastly, let's get into this prim number attribute and prim UVW attribute. This is a very handy feature and I created a very quick example for this. So basically I have a grid that I transformed and then I have a tube and basically I just rate this grid onto this tube. <laughs> So it's kind of like a sticker on top of a bottle idea, I guess. And this is all default, but just enable the hit prim and the hit prim UV. So say, for example, I want to rotate this object and I've done this with a quick expression. So as you can see by the transformation gizmo, this just rotates around its axis. And if you want that sticker to rotate with the bottle, Normally that doesn't really work. So if I put the transfer here, for example, if I template this, you can see this rotates, but obviously the grid just keeps being projected like that. So it won't stick onto the bottle unless you use this attribute interpolate. So you need the transformation separately. So you just have the tube here, the ray here, and a transformation here. And if you then append a attribute interpolate and you have hit prim and hit prim UV in the element node by attributes and the UVW attributes. And you can get that as well from the drop down menu. What you can see now is the sticker, so to say, or the ratio, however you want to call it, rotates with the bottle. So that's quite a nice trick. So lastly, let me show you a few quick examples where this kind of effect is useful. I have a quick bottle and there is a pop network. In the pop network, there's not a particle tutorial, but there's just a constant activation on frame one, and then there's a pop force, so there's a bit of amplitude. This rotates around the axis, and then I appended a pop solver and some gravity, just so that these particles are moving down. And as you can see, when you have general particle simulation, then this will move away from the bottle if we visualize the bottle. But if we use a ray node, then you can see that all these particles stick to this bottle or the cylinder in this case, but you can imagine it being a bottle. So that's a really cool way to visualize some liquid or bubbles on a surface. Another thing that is pretty cool to do is for example, of landscapes. So if you have a landscape, so here I just made a grid. Again, very basically, I just displaced it with a mountain top and then I transformed this down. So obviously we have a bit of distance to do the array effect with. I scattered some points of it and I appended a transform node for later. And now we ray all these points onto this landscape. So now you have all these boxes on the landscape and you can move this as well. So if we merge these together and if you move these objects, you can see they will move over the surface. Obviously you will need to blend it a bit with the normals and the up direction and things, but this is just a very brief, quick overview. And these are just some ideas to get you started. So that was everything you need to know about the Rainout. For more tutorials, go to cgforge.com. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.